Bill, of course, as you know, has been our executive director since 2003. He was a native of Atlanta. He has also been an editor for the United Press International for 30 years and a prize-winning editor for the Columbia State newspaper. He is here tonight to talk about his third book. His first two were, of course, the very lovely pictorial Southern Writers book. He has also written a guide to South Carolina beaches, and he is a co-associate editor of the South Carolina Encyclopedia. And tonight he will be talking to you about his brand new book, Whiskey Kilts and the Loch Ness Monster, Traveling Through Scotland with Boswell and Johnson. You also know Bill, of course, is the purveyor of all things literary in the metro area and throughout the state of Georgia. He, of course, was the co-creator of the book festival in South Carolina. He was one of the co-creators of the Decatur Book Festival. He is, of course, the curator and the person who picks the location for the Georgia Literary Festival. And he has really been a true champion of making the Georgia Center for the Book not only something for the metro area, but truly the Georgia Center for the Book and taking all of our missions statewide. So this evening, ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome my favorite boss and everyone's favorite author tonight. Will you please welcome Bill Starr. Other things that certainly woke everybody up, didn't it? <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, unaccustomed as I am to being at this particular podium, uh, and um, this is really very unusual tonight. Um, I wanted to, to mention this before I get started. Um, there was a, a note in yesterday's AJC. You may have missed it. It wasn't large. Um, listed literary events for tonight, and. Uh, had my name with uh, Whiskey uh, Kills the Loch Ness Monster, and then it added talk and signing with James Boswell and Samuel Johnson. <laughs> I couldn't make this stuff up, folks. So, um, I, have some, I have some sad news for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, neither Mr. Boswell nor Dr. Johnson will be able to join us tonight. Uh, as I, I think you probably know, they have passed away um, a little over 200 years ago. So, um, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I thought uh, the prospect of staring at me for an extended period of time might wear uh, poorly on you. So uh, I have put together uh, my first ever uh, slideshow. And uh, thanks to wonderful Joe Davich, uh, our technical guru, he's made it all work for me, I think. Uh, if it screws up, it's my fault. Uh, and if it works out, it's Joe's credit. So, uh, James Boswell and Samuel Johnson, a Scotsman and an Englishman, took a remarkable trip together through parts of Scotland in 1773. They traveled some three months on foot, by horse, and by small carriage through a country largely unmapped, with few roads and facing all manner of inconvenience. They did so with astonishing good cheer and a great sense of adventure. Both wrote books about it, and reading their books inspired me to undertake a similar journey 234 years later and to write my own book. As I discovered, a few things had changed. For one, it was much easier to get around. I had maps and roads and even a GPS unit that I really could have used if I had only remembered to pack it. Uh, the weather affected all of us uh, because I visited in a tourist off season, that is beginning in late February. I knew I would encounter some difficult weather conditions, 
and I did. To minimize that, I had decided to track Boswell and Johnson backwards. Now, that might seem a bit odd, but uh, others who have attempted the same sort of a journey uh, after Boswell and Johnson have found they've also had to make a number of compromises. I even went to a pair of stunningly unforgettable places that Boswell and Johnson couldn't go because of distance and lack of transportation, the Outer Hebrides and the Orkney Islands. So my book is not only a look back at Boswell and Johnson in 1773 and an American's contemporary view of their experience, but a glimpse of a Scotland that even today very few people visit because of its isolation. I had a spectacular, fun time a marvelous learning experience, and I hope what I found and wrote about will help you enjoy these amazing men and this very amazing country. Boswell was a Scot, born in 1740 in Edinburgh. He was well-educated and eventually became a lawyer, as was his father, Lord Auchinleck. But he had a very troubled relationship with his father. It was so bad, at one point, Lord Auchinleck married his second wife, a woman Boswell didn't like, on the very day of Boswell's own marriage. <laughs> Boswell was subject to depression that could stop him in his tracks, but those low periods were usually followed by times when his spirits were high and exuberant. Boswell was a good husband, a loving father, the most congenial and open of men, and was terrific good company. He was also an alcoholic and a sex addict who took his pleasures wherever he could find them. <laughs> Most importantly, however, he was a literary genius with a photographic memory and an ear and eye for detail who kept journals and diaries in which he courageously recorded his own behavior and that of others, most notably Dr. Samuel Johnson. Boswell's Life of Johnson is, I believe, the finest biography ever written in the English language. Dr. Johnson was the foremost literary figure of mid-18th century England. Born in 1709, he put together a dictionary of the English language that is still a source for many definitions found in the Oxford Dictionary. He wrote poetry, sermons, literary essays. He had a brilliant, if troubled, mind and raised conversation to an art. He could cut lesser men, and even others, with sharp-edged words, and he didn't mind doing so. His literary reputation today is formidable. He was, alas, something of a mess also. <laughs> Physically, he was imposing, but not for good reasons. He was large, over six feet, and corpulent. His pockmarked face could and did scare small children. <laughs> he suffered from a palsy and tics, and could seem both comical and terrifying when he walked. He had bad knees, suffered from gout, and crushing depression. His faith was constantly tested, and he feared he would go mad. So these were the two gentlemen, Boswell, 33, Johnson, almost twice his age, the good friends who'd known each other for 10 years, who set out in 1773 for a trip through Scotland. Both, as I said, would write books about their experiences in this country, a place on the edge of the unknown in the 18th century, a place that even educated people then regarded as a foreign, uncharted landscape where one ventured only at risk to one's life. Johnson came from London, where he lived, to meet Boswell in Edinburgh, where Boswell lived. Boswell and his wife lived in an apartment in a courtyard just off the Royal Mile, the road that connects Holyrood Palace at the bottom and Edinburgh Castle at the top. Their apartment was located approximately in this building, although Boswell's particular unit was destroyed by a fire in the last century. The Royal Mile today is only a little less a narrow passageway than it was in the 18th century. Then, as now, it had tall, multi-story houses and shops on either side, giving parts of the street a rather claustrophobic feeling. This old engraving suggests something of the way it looked to Boswell and Johnson. Edinburgh, at the time, was the intellectual, political, social, and economic capital of Scotland. It was an imposing city. It was, however, also known as the city of thinking and stinking. <laughs> uh, when Johnson first met Boswell upon his arrival, he said, I smell you in the dark. And he wasn't kidding. As the two men walked agreeably arm in arm up the Royal Mile, they encountered the city's night smell. It was terrible. In London, Johnson used to carry an orange pressed against his nose to ward off the stink. He had no such armor in Edinburgh. <laughs> 
Fifty years before Johnson arrived, Daniel Defoe had visited Edinburgh and wondered if its citizens delighted in stench and nastiness. He concluded the city stinked intolerably. A later historian described the disgusting practices in the city quite vividly. Brace yourselves. <coughs> The slops of each of the many storied households were hurled out into the street at night to dribble away down the hill if they were liquid, to await the later arrival of the scavengers if they were solid. And by slops, it should be remembered, were not only the dregs of the kitchen, but all the contents of the chamber pot. When the warning bell for the nightly deluge and cascade sounded all over the city, men in even the deepest taverns in the most secluded clubs would light brown paper spills to fumigate the atmosphere against the all-pervading, all-penetrating fetor. It was not very nice. <laughs> At Boswell's apartment, Johnson learned he would meet Boswell's wife, and he offered to put on a clean shirt, an admission of some great significance given everyone's general state of uncleanliness. Tis needless, Boswell said, either don't see her tonight or don't put on a clean shirt. Johnson replied, I'll do both. He was charming and everyone got along. Their conversation lasted well into the morning hours. This cartoon suggests that Boswell talked Johnson to sleep, but that was not at all the case. And the only problem came when Johnson found his bedside candle would burn much more brightly if he turned it upside down. Regrettably, that poured candle grease all over poor Mrs. Boswell's carpet. Uh, she was angry, but that aside, things calmed down and the two men prepared to begin their most remarkable journey. They headed north toward Inverness, and I took to the west toward the Inner Hebrides. In other words, I began tracking them backwards and we undertook our separate journeys for pretty much the same reasons, weather, always a matter of concern in Scotland, which I'll talk a little more about later. That took me to the small royal burg of Inverary, near the top of Loch Fine, and the hotel where Boswell and Johnson stayed. My room there was just a bit larger than the one Boswell and Johnson stayed in, although, amazingly enough, I think I used the very same pillow. <laughs> This is the view from the room that they're said to have used, looking out over lovely Loch Fine, and they aren't the only ones who stayed at the hotel. In 1788, the wonderful poet Robert Burns visited, but he didn't much care for what he saw and left a bit of doggerel that I don't have time to quote here. I asked the young desk clerk if she knew that uh, Boswell and Johnson had stayed there, and she replied that she was working only the afternoon shift, and I'd have to ask the manager. <laughs> The manager told me that he had not seen them, and when I <laughs> remarked that they had actually visited in 1773, he laughed and said, well, he wasn't nearly that old. <laughs> uh, Inverary Castle is here, and it was and is the seat of the powerful clan Campbell, the most important family in the Highlands, if not in all of Scotland. So, of course, Boswell wanted to visit the Duke of Argyle, who lived there. There was a slight problem, however, because Boswell and the Duke's wife had been on opposite sides of a legal matter some time before, and there was some um, unpleasantness and tension that existed between the two. Uh, Boswell did go to pay his respects, and at a time when he thought the Duchess and her ladies would be gone. He found uh, the Duke most amiable, enjoyed a fine meal and good claret, and explained uh, his most curious journey. At one point, the Duke introduced his wife to Boswell when she showed up, and Boswell reported that she, quote, took not the least notice of me. The two travelers returned the next day, and Boswell introduced Johnson to the Duke and recorded with typical candor and clarity um, the enchanting impression made upon uh, him by, uh, well, I'll just read this to you, a rather unduply topic. Boswell wrote, I shall never forget the enchanting impression made upon my fancy by some of the ladies' maids tripping about in neat morning dresses. After seeing nothing for a long time but rusticity, their elegance delighted me, and I could have been a knight errant for them. <laughs> How can you not love Boswell? Um, what, what intimate frankness, while uh, his good friend Dr. Johnson is being escorted by the most powerful man in Scotland. All horny Boswell can think of is, boy, those little maids look absolutely uh, lovely. Um, too bad. Uh, the castle is uh, open to visitors uh, these days during part of the year. Um, regrettably, 
during the part of the year I was there, which is the off season, uh, it was not open. Uh, this next cartoon portrays uh, a rather odd moment on the trip, and uh, one of the scariest one for, for Boswell and Johnson. Um, they found themselves at sea and, and caught in a terrible storm, and the ship was tossed back and forth. Dr. Johnson went below deck and uh, got quite seasick. Uh, Boswell uh, rather courageously stayed on the deck, although he was just uh, getting drenched in water, and uh, he was nervous. The captain of, of the ship uh, gave him a rope to hold. This cartoon shows that happening. Uh, the rope was attached to the mast, and it did uh, absolutely nothing. But it distracted Boswell. It gave him something to do, and he focused with all his energy on holding that rope for about two or three hours. He did it wonderfully, uh, and really rather bravely, if you think about it. This is a, a tiny little ship, and being tossed about could have gone overboard any time. Um, when the storm eased a little bit, Boswell went, went down uh, below deck, found Dr. Johnson had recovered, and was wondering what was all the, the talk about. Boswell then proceeded to get seasick. I had no such experience. Um, just before getting to Inverary, Boswell and Johnson had stopped at the island of Iona, so that was my next stop. The island is at the tip of Mull in the Inner Hebrides, and it's reachable only by ferry. Getting on and off that ferry is something of an adventure when the sea is rough as it was during this trip. Um, you have to drive onto that ferry, and if the water is high, you just kind of drive through it and <coughs> climb on. Boswell and Johnson arrived uh, at Iona after that frightening experience at sea and spending time on the island of Call. Their boat couldn't quite get to the shore, and Johnson, who had poor vision, jumped out of the boat too early and found himself up to his knees in water. He exploded in rage and berated everyone around him. Should this wedding bring upon me a fatal disease, pray take care that my corpse rot in London soil and by no means amongst the savage chiefs and plunderers of the Highland clans. <laughs> um, Johnson eventually did get over his anger uh, and his experience amid the ruins of Iona's Abbey Cathedral actually left him quite moved. The Abbey has been restored to some extent and today probably looks better than it did in 1773. Iona itself occupies a unique place in Scottish history, which Boswell knew well. It is an enduring symbol of Christianity and has been a sacred destination for pilgrims over hundreds of centuries. It was here that Columba, later to become Saint Columba, arrived from Ireland in 563 AD to found a monastery that would become the heart of the Scottish church for many centuries. Boswell went into the cathedral and found himself overcome by the significance of the structure and of Iona. He resolved to live a better life. This was not the only time Boswell did that. <laughs> and read some Bible passages out loud. I put myself near where I believe Boswell stood and found myself suddenly caught up with emotion. I believe I said, bless all who have been here. And then added, added hi, Bozzy. <laughs> I suspect I startled the tourist who behind me. Before they got to Iona and after I left it, we three travelers found ourselves on the small, partially, uh, partially populated island of Rasse, seen in the distance here, just off the coast of Skye, one of the most picturesque areas of Scotland. It was on Rasse that Boswell had one of his finest times. This engraving shows another view of the island. And this is the hotel where I stayed. Um, it was a much uh, more modern hotel, and I really had no issues there. It's close to the establishment where Boswell and Johnson stayed, but unfortunately, that burned to the ground several years ago. And the hotel, where you see here, um, had some wonderful food uh, and an Italian chef named Giovanni. <laughs> On an island of maybe 700 people, an Italian chef, well, anyway. Um, excuse me. The uh, visit led to one of the delightful highlights of the journey. Boswell and some companions took a long walk around Rasse and finally climbed to the top of the highest peak on the island, Dun Khan, 1,400 feet, and there enjoyed a picnic lunch and a highland reel. This cartoon shows with some accuracy, we think, what happened. <coughs> Boswell had an absolutely terrific time. There were some pretty young women on the island and both he and Johnson uh, came away with uh, having had a good experience. There is, however, um, 
A tragic side to Rasse, whose population has declined over the centuries, it involves something called the clearances, and that involved the eviction of crofters or farmers from their lands. What happened was the mass eviction of the crofters of the land on southern Rasse by their 19th century landlords who wanted to improve their bottom lines by converting the land to raising sheep and breeding deer. The tenants who'd held their land for centuries were reverted to the, uh, were, excuse me, resettled to the less desirable parts of northern Rasse and the small island of Runa. One owner of Rasse constructed a stone fence across the island, a precursor to the hated Berlin Wall, if you will. To the south, sheep, deer, and rabbits grazed. To the north, men and women attempted to use their miserable slices of land for their animals and crops and to remit an annual rental, which, if defaulted on, would ensure yet another eviction. From the Inner Hebrides, I left Boswell and Johnson behind and took the three and a half hour ferry to the Outer Hebrides, to the island of Lewis, which you see at the top of that map. I arrived just in time for one of the harshest storms in years to hit the island. <laughs> Winds reached just over 100 miles an hour the first night I was there. Uh, my sturdy little stone crofter's cottage, however, was just like a rock. It never budged. Uh, but I was so cold that night, I could scarcely move. There weren't enough blankets, and I couldn't get the peat fire hot enough. It really takes a little time to learn how to make the peat furnace, the peat, the peat fire work. Uh, I did learn, however, of necessity, and fortunately it did warm up into the 30s. <laughs> when the sun finally came out, this was the view looking out <clears throat> toward the North Atlantic. It, it is really gorgeous. Uh, the next closest piece of land as you look out there is Newfoundland. I went outside, cheered by what I saw, and uh, the wind blew me into the side of my car. Uh, the Outer Isles form a 130 mile long archipelago made up of some 200 islands, most of them very small and quite uninhabited. They are also the heart of the Gaelic culture. A majority of the islanders speak Gaelic, though its usage is threatened by the increasing incursion of English from tourists like me and businessmen from the mainland. But it is taught in the schools and churches. It is beautiful, and it would be very sad to see it disappear. The scenery is spectacular. Some of it is bleak. Parts of it were seen in Stanley Kubrick's film 2001, A Space Odyssey. These are the imposing standing stones of Kalanish, which date back as far as 3000 BC. The tallest of the stones marks the entrance to a burial cairn, but we're not certain why the stones are arranged, uh, arranged as they are, nor what exactly they might mean. I like the people that I met very much, um, and they seem very accepting of me, but not everyone has held to uh, a very high view of these people. Uh, the late Scotsman Alasdair Alpin McGregor relentlessly chronicled a series of offenses committed by the residents in a 1949 book. He wrote knowledgeably, knowledgeably about the island's geography, archaeology, and history, but it, when it came to the drunken, lazy, whoring, useless people who inhabited the islands, those are his words, not mine, he was extremely negative, and his attitudes uh, grew from barely tolerant to almost abusive. Let me count the ways. This is the quote. Two characteristics of the people, which the stranger to the Western Isles is swift to observe, certainly so far as the male population is concerned, are laziness and drunkenness. Women, on the other hand, are never idle. Indeed, they're never allowed to be. And a darn good thing, too, he writes, because on the whole, the women of the Outer Hebrides are plain, many of them exceedingly so. The women, he says, bloom early and fade early <laughs> and are spent within a few years after marrying. Um, I should point out that I acquired this picture. I did not make it. The women that I saw on the Outer Hebrides were uh, lovely. <clears throat> One of the things that pleasantly surprised me was the quality of food I found all over Scotland, even in the most remote, remote regions. The food, for the most part, was fresh and, where possible, locally grown. Scottish food, however, has not always been held in the highest um, 
Uh, some of you are laughing. I'm, you, you may be familiar with some of this. Uh, cookery books from 18th century Scotland contain some pretty bizarre tales, including suggestions, for whatever bizarre reason, on how to fool diners. For instance, this is the quote, to make a tame duck pass for a wild one, knock it on the head with a stick. <laughs> one traveler wrote that he was most often served carry-on, but only after it had been kept for a fortnight and perfumed with the aromatic air passed through the clammy trunks of flesh flies, and then heated and served with butter. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, a boiled sheep's head was considered something of a delicacy, um, and most important in preparation was holding the head over the fire to singe off all the wool. Some chefs uh, sent the head to the local smithy to be certain it was fully singed. Mm. I can tell you're getting hungry. Uh, and of course, there's the national dish, the celebrated haggis, the soul and glory of Scotland, a compilation of oats and offal usually boiled in a sheep's stomach. It prompted Robert Burns' admiring description, great chieftain of the puddin race, an ode that's quoted when Scottish societies gather to celebrate Burns' birthday, and the disparagement of others. To quote here one example, an author who cited haggis as a dish not more remarkable or more disgusting to the palate than in appearance. <laughs> uh, I had sampled haggis for myself in a previous visit to Scotland and didn't feel a need to repeat the experience <laughs> now. Um, I found it edible then uh, and, and pretty good, but it actually took more than a few drams of whiskey to get me to that point. From the Outer Hebrides, it was a long journey by car and ferry to the Orkneys, which are a long way from everywhere. They consist of some 70 or so islands, all sparsely populated. At their closest, they're no more than 10 miles from the Scottish mainland, but their history connects more closely to Scandinavia, especially the Vikings and later the Norwegians, than to the Scots. They're not a place that you come by accident, um, although you can see uh, the main island here is, is lovely. You have to plan to get there, and they're actually closer to Scandinavia than they are to most of Great Britain. My cottage was near Kirkwall, the biggest city in the Orkneys. It was solidly built, but it didn't have to be as immovable as the cottage in the Outer Hebrides because the Orkneys have fairer weather. Uh, but they do have a lot of wind all the time, every day, no matter where you go, it's windy. That's why there are precious few trees around. Um, historic and prehistoric sites abound on the Orkneys, so it was hard to be there more than a few days without discovering my inner archaeologist. At Mays Howe, a 5,000-year-old site on the mainland, that's the mainland of the Orkneys, a breathtaking Neolithic Stone Age village bumps up against spectacular ritual and burial monuments, and visitors can easily slip back in time. Mays Howe is a large grassy mound with a chambered tomb inside. I entered it by squatting and duck walking through a narrow, tight stone tunnel for about 25 feet. I was sweating from acute claustrophobia the whole time. Um, I finally uh, could then stand up in a small, high-ceilinged and watertight stone chamber with side cells. This was, for hundreds of years, a burial site, apparently, and the effort to create it without machinery thousands of years ago was quite extraordinary to imagine. The passageway to the tomb was aligned by its builders so that at three weeks before and after the shortest day of the year, December the 21st, the light of the setting sun perfectly illuminated the back of the chamber. That's not the best part, however. The Vikings came through here in the mid-12th century and stopped at Mace Howe. They left something of a calling card a series of runic inscriptions carved by knife on the inner chamber walls that are visible and easily interpreted today. These were not the mighty sacred words of kings and lords and leaders. These were the words of the grunts who did the fighting, the rowing, and most of the complaining. Um, what they said turned out to be bawdy, hilarious, lighthearted, a sort of a precursor to Kilroy was here. Otar carved these runes, reads one. Another bears these words, Injero is the sweetest woman there is. <laughs> Yet another appears to say, Thorny bedded Helgi. <laughs> then 
someone else carved his name and apparently mentioned Helgi too, um, <laughs> suggesting she might have been something of a 12th century Viking tart. Um, although I admit that's just conjecture. Uh, it, it is really a, uh, an, an absolutely fascinating place and, and I have a great time there. The St. Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall is a magnificent sandstone cathedral honoring Magnus. It was then Earl Magnus Aronson of Orkney, a man of great piety, who was killed in 1117 and soon thereafter proclaimed a martyr. The church interior, obviously most imposing, holds a number of relics, including the skull of Magnus, showing the head wound that accounted for his death. This is a view of the cathedral to the right and a bit of downtown Kirkwall, and uh, just out of sight uh, is the famous Highland Park Distillery, where a marvelous Orkney single malt is manufactured. I did stop there, uh, <laughs> and at a number of other distilleries, actually, and, and I would urge you all to be sure to visit Scotland. There are also more of the great monuments on the islands whose origins are shrouded in mystery. I apologize to you for a picture of myself, but I'm there only to give you a hint of the size of these stones. So now it was time to rejoin Boswell and Johnson's journey back on the Scottish mainland. And we reconnected at famous Loch Ness. Now, they said little about the Loch and absolutely nothing about Nessie, the monster. I found this, however, to be the heart and soul of the Scottish tourist industry. For here, you have not only one, but two competing Loch Ness Monster Visitor Centers within a few feet of each other, <laughs> separated only by a store selling whiskey. <laughs> um, both of these establishments boast films and exhibits that purport to tell the truth about the monster, but in fact, after listening to both, neither seemed quite convinced of its existence. Uh, they both seem more successful at separating visitors from their money. There is also a Braveheart Visitor Center, which mostly celebrates Mel Gibson, uh, <laughs> who, by the way, was born in New York and is not Scottish. Um, inside the Braveheart facility are several small rooms with paintings depicting colorful moments in Scotland's history. Uh, alas, these paintings seem to have been completed by a fifth grade history class <laughs> as an assignment that none of the students actually wanted. <laughs> The figures are rather crudely drawn and usually depict someone getting killed. I thought it was actually the worst museum I've ever been in, uh, somewhat ahead of the Museum of String I located a few years ago in Iowa. But Loch Ness also uh, has something much more worth seeing, uh, an impossibly picturesque castle ruin, Urquhart, on the banks of the loch. It existed as early as the sixth century when St. Columba came through this way. Blood was last shed at the castle in 1692 when English soldiers blew it up to make certain that Jacobite-leaning Scots would not be using it. And speaking of the Jacobites, that brings us to the Culloden battlefield, scene of the most pivotal clash in Scottish history and arguably the bloodiest, bloodiest in a lengthy history stained by bloodshed. Strangely, Boswell and Johnson came so close to Culloden but didn't stop there. It seems likely that their emotions would have been too tested, given that the events of the battle had occurred less than 30 years before their journey. Culloden was the site of a battle between English troops commanded by the Duke of Cumberland and Highland soldiers of Bonnie Prince Charlie, the young pretender who had come from France to restore the Stuarts to the English crown. Charles was a charismatic 25-year-old who looked about 15 whose charm apparently could and eventually did wear thin. In 1746, his army was tired. It had been in a long retreat and it was stressed when that army was forced to meet the Duke's men, 1746, on what is known as Drum Mossy Moor. It was a weary, wet, cold and dispirited Highlander army that set up for a climactic battle. Some 3,800 men spread thinly without reinforcements in their rear. The English, with all of the advantage of artillery and horse on the field, were ready for the slaughter when the action began at midday. It didn't take long. The English, well, it was, it was a slaughter. <laughs> 
Uh, the battle actually lasted only 40 minutes. Artillery shells shredded the Highlander charge, negating their advantage. The wild rush that used to scare frightened opponents. When the charge finally began across an open field, and the analogy to General George Pickett's charge by brave Confederate soldiers on the final conclusive day at Gettysburg is inevitable. And what happened was a massacre, and when the sides collided, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, bravery succumbed to firepower and numbers. The dead and dying of the Prince's army lay on the field. Cumberland's men advanced on his orders, bayoneting and clubbing anyone who still breathed, earning the Duke his sobriquet of butcher, though whether the killings were justified remains in doubt. The Duke estimated his army losses at some 300 men. The number of Highlanders killed was said to be close to 2,000, although historians say we will never know because so many were missing, either having been carried off the field or having slipped away. The battlefield has many stone markers today. It's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very, very sad sight. You don't have to be Scottish to appreciate uh, what a terrible thing happened, happened here. Um, the battle cost the Scots severely. They were stripped of their clans. The wearing of kilts was forbidden. Their weapons were taken away, and it would take nearly a century to recover. And in that time, the legend of Bonnie Prince Charlie, who created all of this, only grew. And where he failed in historical reality, he apparently succeeded in popular romance, thanks to the like of people like the novelist Sir Walter Scott. It was time to move on, however. Farther down Scotland's east coast, I did what Boswell and Johnson did. It's called castling, visiting one castle after another because, well, who doesn't like to visit castles? This is gorgeous Dunrobin Castle, home to the Dukes of Sutherland. It is magnificent, it has a fairy tale look about it, and a terrible history that goes with it. It was here that the worst of the Scottish clearances took place. Thousands, tens of thousands of farmers were forcibly displaced, their ancestral land seized, and many of them killed or forced to emigrate. In a nearby town, there is a monument erected to the memory of the Duke by, quote, grateful farmers. It is doubtful that many grateful farmers actually were responsible for that. And the monument remains very controversial with a lot of Scots. After all, the Duke who did this was English. For 800 years, until 1980, Brody Castle was the home to the Brody family. 800 years. You may recognize it from the film Rob Roy. Balvini Castle ruins date from the 12th century. And these are the ruins of the beautifully situated Lord Duffus, uh, Duffus Castle, which was abandoned in 1705 with the death of Lord Duffus. And you don't know how hard for me it is to say that because I really want to say Doofus Castle. Um, and if you want to call it Doofus Castle, it's fine. Uh, Glamis Castle is quite handsome and has royal associations. Queen Elizabeth's mother and Princess Margaret were born here. Uh, Blair Castle is magnificent and it is open to the public. It dates back to 1269 and there is a very personal story uh, about this castle that you will have to read the book to, to hear about. And then there's Dunatar Castle, picture book beautiful, the setting for Zeffirelli's film Hamlet. It has a remarkable history. William Wallace, Braveheart fought here. Oliver Cromwell's army laid siege to it. Mary Queen of Scots spent time here. It's most imposing, jutting into the waters of the stormy North Sea. It is the most vividly remembered castle of my journey. If you see those steps, there are about 300 of them. They go down, and then eventually you have to take some very narrow, steep steps to get back up to the fort. Um, quite, quite amazing. Uh, I hope you have a chance to visit that. And then we're back to Edinburgh. This is where it began and ended, almost. When Boswell and Johnson returned to the capital, they were together for another two weeks, resting and talking to curious visitors from all over the city. They visited the castle, and it is supposedly there that Dr. Johnson delivered his most famous anti-Scots remark, which is that the noblest prospect that a Scotchman ever sees is the high road that leads him to London. <laughs> Actually, according to Boswell, Johnson tossed off that remark back in 1763 at a tavern in London. I mentioned before that the castle sits at the top of the Royal Mile and offers unbounded views of the countryside for miles around. 
At the other end of the Royal Mile is the Palace of Holyrood House. This is the royal residence of Queen Elizabeth for one week each year. It's open to the public, except when the Queen is there. And it is a hugely popular tourist attraction because of its associations with the ever popular Mary Queen of Scots, she who lost her head to an earlier Queen Elizabeth. When King James V died in 1542, his daughter Mary was only six days old. Sent to France as a child, she married the heir to the French throne who became the King of France in 1559. It wasn't much of a marriage, however, because he died a year later, and Mary married Henry Stuart, Lord Darnley, in what turned out to be something less than a match made in heaven. Um, In 1566, Darnley grew jealous of Mary's relationship with her Italian secretary. Uh, this was a man, not a piece of furniture. Uh, and his name was David Rizzio. One night, Darnley and a group of co-conspirators sneaked up a narrow spiral stairway from his apartment on the floor below the Queen, burst in on a very pregnant Mary and her attendants and the unfortunate Rizzio, who held tightly to the Queen's skirts to protect himself. Darnley dragged Rizzio into a tiny room off his wife's chambers, stabbed him 56 times, someone apparently was counting, and left him dying on the floor. One of the most incredibly dramatic, unbelievably exciting, and breathtaking moments in Scottish history, which, by the way, was described by one historian this way, Mary was greatly distressed by what happened. <laughs> Um, anyway, here's the cool part of the story. When you visit Holyrood and get to these rooms, there's the bedchamber, the spiral chamber, the tiny stabbing room. There's even a brass plaque on the wall that points to Rizzio's blood stains on the floor. I mean, is history not great? Um, alas, the scene is contrived. Uh, I hate to warn you off the tour because the palace is quite interesting in spite of this. But truth be told, the rooms have been changed and remodeled several times since Mary's time. And while the stairway is still around, the rest of the place isn't. Rizzio's alleged bloodstains are, well, whatever they are. The story and the sights have made Holyrood House a huge favorite for tourists for many years, and guidebooks uh, still apparently toss around some of the facts about it rather cavalierly. So that is, that is Holyrood House. And from there we head to our last stop, the visit that was the climactic moment of the journey for Boswell. And that is Auchinleck, the village where Boswell's father, the dour Lord Auchinleck, lived with his second wife. This is the Auchinleck home as it looks today, very much as it did in 1773. Boswell thought Johnson, or rather brought Johnson to meet his father in what surely confirms the love-hate relationship that existed between Boswell and Lord Auchinleck. Throughout his life, Boswell was in search of a father who would love and understand him, or at least tolerate him. Lord Auchinleck could do those things only occasionally. And so Boswell turned to Dr. Johnson, an older man who helped fill those needs. And the visit went fairly well initially. The three men met and talked in the library, seen here, though we don't know specifically how it might have been arranged back in 1773. But there were too many differences of opinion between Dr. Johnson and Lord Auchinleck to prevent a clash. The two men became exceedingly warm and violent in Boswell's words. And then, as we brace for the fireworks, Boswell wrote this. I was very much distressed by being present at such an altercation between two men, both of whom I reverenced, yet I durst not interfere. It would certainly be very unbecoming in me to exhibit my honored father and my respected friend as intellectual gladiators for the entertainment of the public. And therefore, I suppress what would, I dare say, make an interesting scene in this dramatic sketch. Uh, the cartoon, of course, shows Boswell to be a sniveling observer of the scene, and that was most assuredly not the case. Nor did either man strike the other. But we all regret that Boswell took us up to this climactic moment of the trip and then could not find the words to describe what happened. Historians call this the great unwritten scene in Boswell's journal. When the travelers departed two days later, there were no further incidents, and Lord Auchinleck was civil. As I mentioned, Boswell and Johnson headed back to Edinburgh for a couple of weeks together before parting and Johnson's return to London. Meanwhile, I drove a short distance away to the mausoleum 
in Auchinleck where Boswell is buried. It's in the yard of a small church. Unfortunately, it was late in the day and there was no place I could inquire about getting inside. It did strike me as most ironic, however, that Boswell rested there with his wife and his father. I hope they found some peace in the hereafter. As I said, both men wrote books about their travels in Scotland. This is an image of a rare first edition copy of Boswell's book, which I took from the Yale University archives online. It was published after Dr. Johnson's death. And this is a first edition copy of Boswell's greatest book, his biography of Dr. Johnson. Um, and I believe this image also comes from Yale University. My hope is that my book might perhaps inspire or encourage you to read the accounts written by Boswell and Johnson. They're quite different, quite wonderful, quite complimentary. And Boswell's is, by any measure, absolutely delicious and unmissable. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I the biggest difference that I found was that they were all a lot colder uh, than we are here. They, uh, the landlords in the hotels and, and rooms would turn the heat off about five in the afternoon. And so uh, by the time it got to be about eight or 8.30, uh, the house was just stone cold. And I would, uh, would get under the covers, as many covers as I could muster, and try to read. Uh, but it seemed to me that uh, the lights by the bed were all uh, 13 and a half watts. <laughs> and and that, was, that was really difficult too. So, uh, but there again, you don't really want to hear me whine about the trip. It was, it was wonderful. <laughs> yes, anything else? Yes. But the reason I did it was because I wanted to travel when there weren't tourists. Um, I wanted to be able to see places without having to uh, deal with lines of people. I wanted to be able to connect with the Scottish people who lived where I was going. And I was so much better able to do that by traveling off season. I met some uh, wonderful sheep farmers and, and talked about their work and, and the bookstore owners and, and people that I really would not have had a chance um, to meet and, and become acquainted with, I wouldn't say become friends, but become acquainted with in a short period of time. It's, it's something of, uh, of a trade-off because uh, the weather can really be pretty formidable. And, and the arc of my trip was that in, in the beginning, uh, it, was, it was cold, it was windy, it was cold, and it was windy, and it rained a lot. Uh, the, the arc of the second half of the trip was that it was the warmest spring Scotland's had in a hundred years. So, uh, go figure. Everything was open. Uh, the Scots were out sunbathing. They don't do that with bathing suits, by the way. They uh, just, you know, take off the sweater, that's all. I, I was a travel writer uh, three decades ago, and I took a travel trip uh, to, uh, to Scotland. Tayside area, sort of in central Scotland. Had a marvelous time and thought it was a country that I immediately connected with and wanted to, to spend more time in. So I had made several trips back there after that. Um, and I had, in, uh, in the meantime, uh, begun reading Boswell and Johnson and, and read about their 1773 journey and knew I simply had to, had to follow that journey. But I, I'm not uh, uh, Scottish at all. I just love it. I, I should have asked the, uh, the folks to bring me a hot water bottle. Yes, you're, you're, you're quite right. Um, I did have uh, this, the bottles of scotch with me, and, <laughs> and, and those helped. Um, and once I was in so many out of the way places, um, the, the options for dining were, were pretty limited. And in fact, they, they, were, they were mostly you had a choice, and that was it. Uh, in the town of, of Durness, which is up in extreme uh, uh, northeast Scotland. Um, uh, there was only one pub that, uh, where people could, could eat, and, and I went in sort of late one evening, and there was a crowd of, of men in there, all of whom you know, looked at me rather uh, caustically for a moment. Uh, clearly, I did not uh, belong in there, and I was afraid they were going to uh, do something. Uh, but uh, one of them finally turned to me and said, uh, 
not from around here, are you? That's what it <laughs> and, and, and I admitted that was indeed the case. And whereupon everybody uh, turned around and started, started chatting and, and they wanted to know what I was doing there and, and they thought I was slightly crazy. And they prepared a wonderful chicken dish for me to eat and, um, and I drank whatever the local beer was. Um, I forget what it was, I did a lot of that too. And, and it was a, a wonderful experience and we spent the evening chatting and getting to know each other a little bit. Uh, Scottish pubs, as pubs all over, are wonderful places to, to get acquainted with, with folks.